good morning, everyone, and thank you, Jane, for your introduction, and thank you as well to Uncle Mickey for his welcome and to the Minister for his introduction. It's wonderful Is that better? Yeah. It's wonderful to be able to address you in person today. It's been a long time since I've had the opportunity um, to speak to an audience of people in person. I've been reminding myself all morning to check my fly as I walked on stage. It's not a problem that you have when you're doing things on Zoom. So I'm going to begin this morning with a story, and it's a story about camels. There was once an old Bedouin man who, sensing that his death was close, gathered together his three sons to communicate his dying wishes. To his eldest son, he bequeathed half of his inheritance. To his middle son, he bequeathed a quarter of his inheritance. And to his youngest son, he bequeathed a sixth of his inheritance. And sadly, he died soon after communicating these wishes. Now, the entirety of the old man's inheritance consisted of a herd of 11 camels. And this presented his three sons with a problem. How could they divide the herd in half to provide the eldest son with his entitlement? One son suggested that they should slaughter the camels and divide the meat. But this still didn't solve the problem that half plus a quarter plus a sixth does not add up to one. It also meant destroying the ongoing value of their inheritance, which they were sure their father did not want. <clears throat> so the sons began to argue about how to interpret the, their father's wishes, and to avoid the situation deteriorating further, they decided to visit the old sage in their village. The sage told them that all he could offer them was his old skinny camel, the only camel that he owned. This brought the inheritance up to 12 camels, enabling the oldest son to take six camels, his half, the middle son to take his quarter, and the youngest son to take his sixth. The sons were then able to return the 12th camel back to the sage. So what's the moral of this story? Well, the 12th camel transformed the nature of the problem confronting the three sons, who were left with their 11 camels after the 12th made the division possible. Now, this is a story about problems and solutions, and the fact that solutions often depend on bringing a different perspective to the problem, changing the way that the problem is constructed. Now, Alfred North Whitehead, who wrote powerfully about the aims of education, claimed that education is a difficult problem that can be solved with no simple formula. Now, of course, there's no shortage of policies, reports, professional development packages that offer simple formulas that tell us what good teaching is and how to manage schools to ensure that good teaching and learning occurs. My argument today will be that this tendency to simplify the complex is increasing, and it's being driven in large part by the greater and greater volumes of information that we have about students and schools today. These ever-growing volumes of data hold out the promise that the solution is in there somewhere. However, I think we must confront the risk that we're actually becoming lost in a sea of information that doesn't really help us to decide what to do. And this is a problem because society, and thus education, is only becoming more and more complex. Indeed, Yuval Noah Harari has argued that we're in an unprecedented situation in history, in the sense that nobody knows the basics about how the world will look in 20 or 30 years. Not just the basics of geopolitics, but what the job market will look like, what kind of skills our young people will need, what family uh, structures will look like, what gender relations will look like. And he suggests that this means that for the first time in history, we have no idea what to teach. 
in schools. Now, of course, I'm sure we all have many ideas about what to teach in schools, but Harari is pointing to the fact that many of the assumptions we held in previous times about the needs of the younger generation are not so certain today. Society is becoming super diverse. And this is a concept coined by the sociologist Stephen Verdevec to describe how many societies are now characterized by new levels and kinds of social and cultural complexity. The young people in our classrooms bring with them a more diverse set of virtual school bags, to borrow an idea from Pat Thompson, than they've ever done so before. The challenge of climate change grows ever more pressing by the day, and we cannot be sure what the impact will be for the next generation. Indeed, the assumption at the heart of pedagogy, the idea that we teach the younger generation to make their lives better than that of the previous generation, is cast into doubt by the prospect of a heating world. We have a war in Europe for the first time in 60 years, a prospect that felt all but unimaginable this, at this time last year, and the COVID-19 pandemic, now in its third year, is the most significant global health crisis in a century and continues to create daily uncertainty. Since the end of the Cold War, we've lived in a world in which global stability and mobility was assured, but now we find ourselves confronting a new era of geopolitical tensions and restrictions on the movements of people and things. Technological change also creates uncertainty as the development of artificial intelligence, for example, generates new possibilities for automating so many aspects of our lives, creating the risk of technological unemployment and transforming the types of skills that young people will need for work in the future. And the impact of technological change in education has been my area of research focus for the past five or six years. And it will be one of the key elements uh, that I want to talk about today. Now, of course, these social complexities don't stop at the school gate. They transform the nature of work and life in our schools. Last week, I participated in a series of focus group conversations with teachers from across South Australia. And we talked about the changing nature of their work. We covered a range of issues, too numerous to detail today, but three challenges came through particularly clearly. First, and as you would all be very well aware, was the impact of teacher shortages, compounded by COVID-19, which have made this year tremendously challenging for everyone. Teachers in Australia already pour more hours into their work than their colleagues in other countries. And these unsustainable workloads have been further compounded by absence and teacher shortages, particularly in rural and remote schools and in particular subject areas. Second, the students that schools serve today bring a more complex set of needs with them than ever before. Not only because society itself is changing, but also because we retain and serve students who may have left school earlier in previous generations. Our success in terms of pursuing equity also contributes to the complexities that we have to grapple with in our schools. Um, as the Minister made clear, mental health is clearly a major concern and priority, and behaviour is an ongoing challenge. Third, the balance between administration and teaching continues to shift towards the former. One of the teachers I spoke to talked about accountability by documentation, the amount of time poured into documenting everything that happens in the school day. This was recognised in the meeting of federal and state education ministers last Friday, and I think in the National Teacher Workforce Action Plan that was announced. The priority areas in that plan focus on elevating the status of the profession, improving the supply of teachers, strengthening teacher education, better understanding our workforce needs, but also maximising the time to teach, shifting the balance between admin and teaching. 
And today I want to speak directly to that final priority, which reflects the need, I think, for a step change in how we balance administration and, accountab sorry, administration and accountability on the one hand, against providing time for teachers to do what they feel is a good job. We know that what gets teachers out of bed in the morning is the prospect of making a difference for their schools and communities. This is the joy of teaching, and it's the lifeblood of the profession. But the growing demands to do more with less, and particularly less time to prepare properly and teach well, depletes teaching of the joy that is needed for it to be sustainable and for the profession to attract the next generation of teachers. So against this backdrop, I have three aims in my talk today. First, I want to ask, where are we and how did we get here? And drawing on some research that I've done over the past decade, I want to offer one partial perspective on the imbalance between accountability um, and teaching young people two competing demands on our teachers. I will provide a brief history of data-driven accountability and identify a challenge that confronts us today. The risk that as we generate more and more information about education, we can lose sight of the purposes and values that are essential to the profession. I'll then consider how policy contexts characterised by mistrust of teachers and their expertise risk exacerbating this problem by deprioritising the skills that are at the heart of teaching, but also creating opportunities for others, and I'm thinking of key figures in the ed tech sector, to present themselves as more able to solve the complex problems of education today. And then I want to finish by describing an experiment with a different approach to accountability. Drawing on work that I did with a good colleague and friend, Professor Bob Lingard in Queensland. And I'm gonna talk about the Pursuing Equity Through Rich Accountabilities Project. I'll argue that in our present historical moment and in our present policy moment here in South Australia, and I was really heartened by the minister's remarks about the need to focus on wellbeing as opposed to NAPLAN or PISA, um, I think we have a real opportunity to do things differently by experimenting with approaches to accountability that reflect our commitment to the public aspect of public education and that build the public will for change and help us to lead new kinds of professional debates. So before I move on, just a quick caveat. Over the past few weeks, I've had the good fortune of having the flu and then COVID, and I'm freshly out of isolation. So I'm still grappling with a little bit of fatigue, um, and so I'm gonna rely a little bit more heavily on my notes than I would do ordinarily. And I hope, I hope you'll forgive me if my talk's a bit less dynamic than it might be otherwise. Okay. Part one. So, a defining feature of our present era is the process of datafication. Writing in 2013 and coining the term big data, which is relatively new, Victor Mayer Schonberger and Kenneth Kukia argued that we're in the midst of a great infrastructure project, and that project is datafication. Where previous generations built roads and rails, our generation has built an infrastructure for collecting and analyzing data in very large volumes. Now, in some ways, this is very new and novel, but it has a long history, including in education. So let's go back to the first half of the 20th century, or even a bit before. This is an editorial published in the Journal of Educational Research and it was written in 1940 by Professor Percival M. Simons at Teachers College Columbia in New York. And you can see Teachers College pictured here. In this article, Simons argued that education research began 
1874 with the invention of the spelling test in France. Now this is a very narrow argument because of course it equates education research with testing. Simons then surveys some further developments in educational testing during the early 20th century, highlighting the importance of the intelligence testing movement during the First World War. And he argues that the work on intelligence tests during the 1910s started the mass production of tests of achievement in school subjects and inaugurated a rosy era of making education scientific, when whatever exists exists in some amount and hence can be measured, was the slogan. Now this is a slogan that still sounds very familiar to our ears today. And it's echoed, for example, by key education policy figures such as Andreas Schleicher, who heads up education at the OECD and has driven the development of its PISA program. And I know that some students in South Australian schools have been sitting for PISA in recent weeks. Schleicher is very fond of a quote from W. Edwards Deming, which suggests that without data, you're just another person with an opinion. So we can see that from the late 19th century to the beginnings of the 21st century, faith in testing, in measurement, and in data as the basis for education practice has remained relatively constant. During the second half of the 20th century, we saw the development of more systematic approaches to assessment at both national and international scales. National assessment programs like NAPLAN have a history that dates back to the 1950s when the first international comparative assessments were developed. However, things really took off in the 1990s with the development of PISA and then in 2008, with the introduction of NAPLAN here in Australia. These assessments have contributed to the growing volume of data that is used to make judgments about the performance of students, teachers, and schools. And since the introduction of NAPLAN, Australian education has had a top-down, test-based mode of educational accountability. This approach really began to emerge in the 1970s, when accountability in school systems moved away from trust in teacher professionalism, and instead began to focus on holding teachers to account. And standardized testing became one very powerful tool to do so. These sorts of performance data are now made publicly available through websites and the creation of league tables of school performance and this mode of accountability has moved the field of judgment away from teachers and the profession. Um, and it has been made integral to our school systems, ever present in the work of schools, principals and teachers, and affecting curriculum, pedagogy and student learning. Now this approach is evident in the dashboards that are used for accountability in schools right around the world. This is a dashboard from Alberta, Canada, with PAT scores and other measures represented using the very common traffic light color system. And here we have a similar, and I'm sure very familiar dashboard representing the NAPLAN performance of a school here in Adelaide. Despite some superficial differences, the underlying technology is identical. Now, Passy Salberg has argued that the spread of this approach is a central element in the global education reform movement, or GERM. This movement includes the standardization of teaching and learning, a reductive focus on literacy and numeracy, a preference for curriculum prescription, the establishment and extension of education markets, the erosion of the public element of public education, and the use of this data-driven accountability. And I think what's really interesting about this way of representing data is that it works at an almost visceral level, telling a very powerful but very limited story about our schools. If you're faced as a principal with mostly green, then you're going well. But if there's a sea of red, 
then there are problems and they must be addressed. And as principals, you're expected to have a clear strategy for doing so. Now there are, of course, other very important accounts of teaching and learning that do not get captured in these dashboards. For example, a primary school principal in Queensland explained to me that our NAPLAN results go up and down like a yo-yo. And last year's results, well, the year sevens, they were all white. So that says they're comparable to the national average. We're doing okay. But the threes and the fives, they were multicolored. Bits of red, bits of this, bits of that. And overall, it was pretty dismal. However, individual improvement was huge. The individual improvement of our children. So I think this gives us a really clear illustration of how the narrative provided by data dashboards can easily overshadow other important stories. In this case, individual improvement, but also, for example, well-being, which is not being captured presently. These sorts of stories get completely written out of the official account. Now, when I visit schools, I always ask, what data do teachers and leaders use most? And this is an answer from a secondary school principal in Edmonton, Alberta. She explained that the most important data for her is stories, talking most of the time. More often than not, I'm spending time in classrooms and getting a pretty good feel for what's going on by mainly talking to kids, asking them, how's it going? Do you know what your mark is? Why is your mark that? What are you learning right now? Why are you learning that? Those kinds of questions. But then she continued by saying, there are other times of the year that you look at different data, perhaps before a results review, when you're going to have to go in and sit in front of the board of trustees or your boss and say, well, this is how well we've done, or this is how well we haven't done, when diploma exams come in. You know, you might, the first thing I do is say, well, how do we do in comparison with the school district and how do we do in comparison to the province? And we can see here, I think, very clearly the tension that many school leaders experience as they attempt to balance the use of different kinds of data for different purposes. And it shows powerful, how powerful comparisons of performance can be in focusing our attention on what gets measured. Okay, so here I want to give a personal example. This is a bar graph that represents my research performance when I was working at a previous university. And it compares my performance with everyone else at my level, everyone else in my school, everyone in my faculty, and everyone across the entire university. Every time I published a paper or graduated a student or brought in some income, my bar would inch forward a little and everyone else's would inch back because it was an index that worked that way. This was updated every 24 hours. So the performance measurement and comparison was constant. Now, the irony was that at this time, I was writing about the very things that I've just spoken about, discussing the problems with data-driven accountability. So I would write a paper critiquing these mechanisms and my score would go up. <laughs> and even though I was really aware of the problems with this, I would still find myself logging in from time to time to take a look at my bar graph. And I'd feel pleased to see if it had inched forward a little bit. Now, perhaps you've also experienced this attraction of comparison. When we don't compare well, it's easy to be dismissive of these approaches. But when we do compare well, then it's easy to get drawn in. <clears throat> But this comes with risks, not least the risk of goal displacement, which is the effect of data-driven accountability that I would argue has been most damaging because it focuses our attention 
or forces us to attend to, a few narrow things that get measured, and it undermines conversations about the broader idealistic purposes of education. So I, I want to finish this section of my talk with a classic example of goal displacement. And it comes from the health sector rather than from education. In this example, which is a true story, a hospital emergency room was given a brand new set of KPIs. One of these was a target to reduce the amount of time that patients wait for their initial assessment to less than 20 minutes. So they had to see patients within 20 minutes of them walking into emergency. However, it was taking much longer to process patients and the hospital wasn't sure what to do. So they went with the old reliable approach of bringing in a consultant. Now the consultant spent a few days understanding how the emergency room operated and came up with a plan. He recognised that while some patients arrived in ambulances, other patients travelled to the hospital via public transport. And at the front of the emergency room, there was a bus stop. And each time a bus arrived, a group of patients would all flow in at once, seeking attention. And this created a bottleneck, and it contributed to the, contributed, sorry, to the overall lengthening of wait times. So what did the consultant do? He moved the bus stop 100 metres down the road. And this had the effect of staggering arrivals at the hospital, because the elderly and unwell patients took longer to walk that distance. Now, while this solution had the desired impact of reducing wait times and enabling the emergency room to hit its KPI, it clearly did not serve the original purpose of the target, which was to provide more timely care to sick people. And I think the risk of data-driven accountability is that we start moving the bus stops rather than focusing on the primary purposes of education, on actually making a difference for our students and their communities. Okay, at this point, I'd like to pause and invite a little bit of interaction. I'd like you to join me in taking a test. There'll be two questions, a literacy question and a numeracy question. Let's take the numeracy question first. The scenario is that you're hiring a surfboard. The surf shop has surfboards for hire at $15 per hour or part of an hour, up to a maximum of $60 per day. What is the cost of hiring a surfboard from 9.30 a.m. to midday on the same day? Now, I'll give you some time to think, but please raise your hand if you'd like to offer an answer. An early taker up the front here. $45? Are people in agreement with $45? Any dissenting views? $45 is correct. Oh, did we have a dissenting view? Okay, so the, there's different ways potentially of interpreting the item. I came up with $45, but I'm willing to entertain the fact that there could be alternatives. Okay, let's move to the literacy question. I'd like you to imagine that you're reading through the duty of care policy at your school. The policy includes the following sentence with a word missing. A teacher's duty of care is not restricted to school activities. The duty blank applies to situations both before and after school where a teacher can be deemed to have assumed the teacher-student relationship. Which one of the following words best completes the sentence? Also, rarely, mostly, or conversely? And again, I'll give you a moment to consider your answer. Any volunteers? Yeah. 
also. Also is what I had as well. Okay. These two items are drawn from a set of practice questions for the literacy and numeracy test for initial teacher education students, or land type. The rationale for land type, as explained by the Australian Council for Education Research, is that it is designed to assess students' personal literacy and numeracy skills to ensure that teachers are well equipped to meet the demands of teaching. Now, my reason for sharing these items with you is simply to make the point that the skills these tests are assessing are routine skills. Answering the surfboard question requires a very simple formula and finding the correct missing word in the duty of care policy is the type of problem that the most basic natural language processing algorithms can take care of very easily. So I would argue that these items do not test the skills that are most essential for teachers to meet the demands of their profession, but rather they test the aspects of teachers' knowledge that are most susceptible to automation. And this brings me back to my short history of data-driven accountability. And I want to add another layer to that history now. Over the same period during which we saw a rise in standardised assessments and a shift towards top-down data-driven accountability, we also saw a significant change occurring in labour markets. In this chart, you can see four lines, but I only want you to focus on two, the grey line and the green line. The grey line represents labour productivity, effectively how much work is getting done. And it has grown steadily since the 1950s. The green line represents employment, and it grew steadily until 2000, when it began to plateau. Since 2000, more and more work has been done, the grey line keeps going up, but the number of workers has not increased. Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee refer to this as the great decoupling, the fact that we no longer need human workers to do many kinds of work today. And it's this shift which has given rise to recent debates about the risk of technological unemployment as we develop more sophisticated algorithms and robotics to replace humans. Some areas of work are particularly susceptible to automation, most notably for the argument that I'm making, mathematical technicians and roles that involve data entry and lots of basic administration. While teaching is one of the professions at the very lowest risk, and this is due to the fact that teaching involves complex emotional labour and that sits at the very heart of teachers' work. If teaching was simply a matter of mastering basic literacy and numeracy skills and filling in forms, then the risk of automation would shoot right up. However, there's a lot of money being invested in experimenting with the possibilities for replacing classroom teachers today, particularly in the edtech sector. Edtech is growing quickly, very quickly. This chart shows global levels of investment in new edtech companies from 2010 to 2022. And as you can see, the curve is exponential, from $500 million in 2010 to $20 billion in 2021. And there's one consistent theme animating this sector at the moment. The belief that capturing more and more data will give rise to new disruptive solutions that will not only be highly profitable, but may also reduce the need for human teachers by moving learning to digital platforms that enable greater levels of personalization. Now, the pandemic dramatically accelerated the use of digital platforms in education and the potential for tech companies 
to promote their narratives about the benefits of their technology. Ben Williamson and Anna Hogan have argued that the state of emergency confronted in many countries as schools were closed and classes were moved online enabled key figures in the tech world to take up positions of authority as experts in reimagining education for the future and reimagining it in ways that reflect their pre-existing visions, their financial support for technology-centred models of schooling and their efforts to influence policy agendas. Now, I believe that EdTech has an important contribution to make to the future of education. I've recently written a book with colleagues that argues we should stay open to the possibility that AI could offer powerfully transformative ways of thinking about how we do schooling today. It could be a 12th camel. However, we're not there yet, and there are some worrying trends being driven by the ed tech sector. The first is the way that teachers are often positioned in these stories as being wedded to old ways of doing things and narrowly protective of their jobs, which is why they stand in the way of technological change. I think teachers are often presented as a problem that new technologies and tech companies can solve through their disruptive innovation. The second worrying trend is the notion that if we simply collect more and more data, then we will be able to develop solutions to long-standing educational problems. A common mantra is that data is the new oil, a notion that's frequently repeated by edtech investors and which drives business plans that focus on acquiring as much data as possible and then figuring out what to do with it. Now, what's most pernicious about this idea is not simply the grab for data for students' personal data as a means of profit, but the point that oil is only valuable once it's refined. We don't need more data in education at the moment. We need better refineries. We need ways to navigate the seas of information that confront us with purpose, and we need this purpose to underpin what we do. So I, I wanna finish this section of my talk with an insight from a software developer who I interviewed for a recent project, because I think it offers a useful counterpoint to the narrative that I've just provided. We were having a discussion about the benefits of ed tech and he observed that there are some important aspects of education that technology simply cannot replace. He said that growing up through an education system, you always find people that you look up to and you look up to them for their human qualities. And I think that replacing that teaching with something that's purely automated would mean that people miss out on something that is critically important. A lot of education is about learning how to be a person. Okay, so on that note, I want to move to the final section of my talk. And I'm going to argue that we need different approaches to accountability. Approaches that help us to refine data rather than simply generating more of it. Approaches that help us to stay focused on the fundamental purposes of education rather than encouraging us to move the bus stops. This, at the bottom of the screen there, you can see an aerial view of Bundaberg in central Queensland. Attractively sunny compared to the weather recently here. From 2011 to 2016, I worked with a group of colleagues on what we called the Petra Project, pursuing equity through rich accountabilities. And the primary aim of the project was to experiment with alternative approaches to accountability and education. We worked with a cluster of eight schools that were on the very northern fringe of their region. And the regional office was at the very southern fringe. 
The principals in these schools were concerned about their distance from the regional office. And it manifested as a perceived lack of support for their schools, and they felt like they were being managed at a distance through what were called desktop audits at the time. Judgments made about schools using a nine page set of data dashboards. One of the principals described her school's experience of a desktop audit as being highly damaging for staff who felt that the audit did not do justice to the realities of their school and its community. She and her colleagues lamented that no one from the regional office had even visited the schools for their annual presentation nights. So this was a perfect context in which to experiment with a different way to do accountability and to try and open up some conversations about what counts and what gets counted in schools. The Petra project had five main phases. We conducted case studies of account accountability pressures in the eight schools that we were working with. We worked with teachers and students to design curriculum projects that explored their communities. We ran a number of action research cycles with teachers. And we established what we called a learning commission, a new model for accountability in schools. And my focus here will be on this learning commission. So we took inspiration for this idea of a learning commission from an example in the UK. We'd heard about an experiment in the town of Pickering in North Yorkshire that we thought just might work in Bundaberg. Pickering, like Bundaberg, had a history of devastating flooding and there'd been a heated debate in the town about how to prevent the flooding from damaging uh, people's properties. After a major review, a proposal was made to build a flood wall around the town. But different government agencies couldn't agree on whether or not this would work, and ultimately the idea was shelved. But it wasn't clear to people in Pickering why the proposal had been shelved, why it couldn't be built, and why the knowledge informing that proposal had been seemingly disregarded. And things became stuck in a holding pattern. People were frustrated, nothing was being done. In this context, a team of researchers from Oxford University set up a group, and they called it a competency group. And it brought together members of the public with scientific experts. And in this case, the scientific experts were hydrologists who had all kinds of models of the flooding in the town. And they were able to adjust those models to see how different approaches to preventing the flooding might play out. The research team invited members of the public to come and work with the scientists to experiment with the models and try out their ideas. And this helped people to understand why the flood wall wouldn't work. But it also created opportunities for people to share their knowledge about the local water catchment. And as they did so, the hydrologists adjusted their models and ultimately arrived at an approach that involved building small dams at key points upstream in the water catchment. Now, we were intrigued about this example because it showed what could be done when data, the hydrological models, was refined through public discussion and experimentation. The solution that was reached would not have been possible with the modeling alone. It needed local knowledge to transform the data into something useful. So borrowing from this approach, we convened a learning commission, our own group of the same sort. The learning commission was chaired by a former school principal with extensive experience working in the region. And the other members of the commission included a member of the regional council who was responsible for community services, um, a community development worker, a journalist from the local newspaper who'd been giving the schools in Bundaberg a really hard time and focusing on things like students getting caught with drugs on um, school property, an indigenous teacher who was responsible for embedding Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the curriculum, and the Director of Strategic Policy and Research from the Education Department. 
And the researchers from the project team also attended all of the commission meetings, performing a similar role to the hydrologists in the Pickering example. We shared all kinds of research and relevant data. We worked through NAPLAN data and other things with the commission. Now the commissioners saw opinions from a range of other groups as well. They spoke to parents, they spoke to um, other principals and teachers, to students, to community groups, um, to a group of indigenous elders from the community and to business people. Students who were involved in the community history projects also contributed their insights along with their teachers. And all of this work was guided by a set of three questions that the commissioners asked. They wanted to find out what do communities expect from schools? Not what does the system expect from schools, but what does the local community expect? And then they wanted to know how schools could demonstrate if those expectations were being met and what kinds of evidence could be provided to demonstrate that they were meeting those expectations. So it was an opportunity for community members to get involved in deciding what counts and what gets counted in schools. The work of the Learning Commission generated findings that we grouped into four key themes. The Commission provided schools with some ammunition to argue for the need to revise system-wide accountability practices, to push back on the desktop audits that were felt to be so damaging. It highlighted some alignments between what schools were doing and what communities wanted, but also some gaps and gave the principals some ideas about where they could make different kinds of connection to their local communities. It demonstrated the benefit of increasing community access and involving the community in the work of schools. And it created spaces to talk about meaningful teaching and learning practices. At the end of the project, the member of the regional council who served on the commission commented that the benefit was the process itself. She said, when was the last time that someone actually asked the sector, as the commission has, what they want, how they feel, or how they would like it delivered? You might have filled in a survey at school, but here you've actually involved a cross-section of students, a cross-section of teachers, and a cross-section of community people, workers, parents, and so on. And the local journalist who was involved in this work, and I think this might have felt like the biggest win for many of the school principals, started writing much more positive stories about schools in the region based on the insights gained through her involvement in the process. So on the basis of the Commission's work, we theorised a different approach to educational accountability which has three components, information, practices, and values. And our model seeks to bring values back into the equation. So if you look at the model of data-driven accountability here, my argument would be, and it's evident in the example that I shared of the hospital, that information drives practice in really tight feedback loops, and the risk is that you do things that make the information look better, and values get uh, cut out of the equation effectively. In the approach that we experimented with, we still saw information generated from standardised assessments and other sources as important. As the Minister noted, we still have to think about our PISA scores and our NAPLAN scores. But that information is only valuable in relation to a specific set of purposes for schooling and in relation to the practices that get changed by producing that information. And so we wanted to involve a wider set of stakeholders in determining what got counted. Now changing practice is often the primary focus for collecting all of this data in the first place. And it can be used to change teachers' practice, parents' decision making, school leadership, and so on. And while any information can act as a catalyst for change, the big risk, as I suggested earlier, is goal displacement. In this case, practice gets changed in ways that produce better information, but don't necessarily make a difference. The judgments made in relation to data can benefit from being made as close as possible to the practices that will be changed. And this en enables teachers' professional expertise and other values to inform the judgments that are made about schools. 
Finally, values should guide the use of information. Any approach to accountability should begin with a debate about the value and purposes of schooling. The important question to ask is, how do values shape the production of information about school performance, and are those values reflected in the ways that we teach young people? So our approach moved away from data-driven accountability towards what we called rich accountability. It brought a wider set of values back into the mix by making public the conversation about what counts and what gets counted in schools. Each of the three model, uh, elements in our model should feed into the others, and none of them can be ignored. Okay, I want to finish up with another story, and it goes something like this. There was a man who was once flying across a field in a hot air balloon, and he realised that he'd become lost. He saw a woman on the ground, and he called out to ask her where he was. The woman replied, you're 53 degrees north, 20, uh, sorry, 53 degrees and 28 minutes north, that's critically important, that detail, two degrees and 14 minutes west, 40 metres above sea level, and you're heading due north by northeast. Thanks, the man replied. By the way, are you a data analyst? Yes, replied the woman, how did you know? Because everything you told me was totally accurate, you gave me way more information than I needed, and I still have no idea what I need to do. But the story doesn't end there. And by the way, replied the woman, are you an academic? Well, yes, said the man. How did you know that? Well, you've got no idea where you are, no idea what direction you're heading in. You got yourself into this situation by blowing a load of hot air, and now you expect me to get you out of it. Now, I've probably blown a load of hot air this morning, telling stories about camels, refineries, and flooding. But hopefully I've also managed to convey an important point. The growing complexities we confront in society and in our schools, and the crises confronting our teacher workforce today, demand a change to teachers' work, and a change to the ways that account accountability mechanisms shape that work. In a terrific book that I highly recommend, New Dark Age, James Bridle diagnoses the condition that I've been describing, a condition in which we find our technological capabilities radically enhanced, giving us access to unprecedented amounts of information, yet we risk knowing less and less about what we should do. Bridle argues that we find ourselves today connected to vast repositories of knowledge, and yet we have not learned to think. And here, he's giving a particular emphasis to the word think, an emphasis that goes beyond the cognitive aspects of thought to embrace the ethical dimension of thinking, the values that must be embedded in the way that we make judgments about the performance of our students, teachers, and schools. On the back of the meeting of federal and state education ministers last week, and in a new political moment for education in South Australia, I think we have an opportunity to address what I have argued is a long-standing trend towards top-down modes of data-driven accountability that contribute to diminishing the joy of teaching and the benefits that great teachers can bring to their students and communities. James Bridal argues that in our new dark age, we must sustain a moral commitment that is beyond the abilities of pure computational thinking in order to remain capable of speaking directly to what is in front of us, of thinking clearly and acting with justice. I've offered one example of how we might pursue this task through a different approach to accountability that engages the public in public education creating opportunities to discover a 12th camel that might help to transform the way we think about educational problems. However, I don't want to offer this example as a simple formula and suggests that it 
suggests, and suggests, sorry, that it needs to be rolled out in other contexts. Rather, I want to leave you with a provocation to explore different ways to sustain conversations about the purposes and value of education in order to help us navigate this challenging time for schools and in order to sustain the profession and the difference that we know it can make. Thank you. Thank you.